We will find you in your sleep! Sleep? I never sleep. I just wait in the shadows and I will kill you all. Everyone who sniffed the air that day in Sewa! Another Assassin's Creed game has finally arrived, and it is safe to say that I am back on my bullshit. In my very short time spent with Origins, I can see it shaping up to be one of the series' best, refining some of those promising ideas that were executed a little clunky in earlier games, while throwing away others wholesale, taking cues instead from other cultural juggernauts. Origins addresses many of the problems that have plagued the franchise since its genesis in 2007, and while there are still some fundamental issues with its structure, it's lovely to return to something like this after years of stagnation. There is a more ancillary aspect of the series that has also made a return, one that folks will no doubt be divided on. The Animus. D. Hey, I was wondering if I should pull you out. Almost universally reviled as the worst part of any Assassin's Creed game, these science fiction intermissions that rudely awake you from your foray into historical worlds and force you to enjoy a glorified Wikipedia summary of a shit sci-fi novel present what I see as a troubling dilemma for the series. These moments are inarguably the worst sections of any AC game. Writing is not the series' strongest suit, so when you're wrestled away from your lovely time crawling around the rooftops of a historically approximated world to basically stand around listening to someone bleat on about evil corporations and mystical WMDs, you can't help but feel a bit resentful. Even Ubisoft have cottoned on to the disdain of its fanbase, with more recent entries greatly trimming down the amount of time spent outside of the Animus leading to a lot of people questioning why they don't just remove it entirely and soft reboot the franchise. While on paper that sounds like a prudent manoeuvre, removing the Animus would also remove one of Assassin's Creed's strongest hidden features, and my gut tells me that doing so would ultimately harm the series. Let's talk about immersion. With the scope and visual fidelity of games ever increasing, so too has their complexity. Reading gaming's visual language is a tough thing to get right, and even with those titles whose control schemes and mechanics eventually become an extension of the player, there's a learning curve to get to that point. Virtually nothing about the way games control is intrinsic. There's nothing natural about press X to jump, and even for those titles with a more abstract art direction, very few craft a visual learning matrix within which the method of interaction is intrinsically ingrained. We don't really have a gaming equivalent of something like Orthogonal Diagonal, Nova Jiang's remodeled chess set that conveys the rules of the game in the design of the pieces. Because of this, visual communication is incredibly important, and as I see it, there are two main ways to convey the rules of your game. Overt, or in abstract. You can't really pick and choose which form to utilise either. The visual language of a game like Tearaway works because the game and its art direction are formed around a wild diversion from reality. It might not make sense to have a giant block with the X button emblazoned on it, but it works. In a game more interested in a realistic, high fidelity, immersive experience, planting visual information like this would be jarring and out of tone like putting one of Dali's melting clocks in a constable landscape. So the alternative is to instead offer a heads-up display, vomiting contextual symbology across the screen, visual cues that overtly address the player's need for clarity. This can often end up becoming something of an aesthetic klaxon that constantly reminds you that you are playing a game, thus impeding immersion. 
The degree to which this is an actual problem remains firmly in the hands of the audience though, and many titles offer HUD-free options to allow the player to immerse themselves better, but rarely are games built to accommodate this. Playing Assassin's Creed Origins for just a couple of minutes HUD-free was lovely, it's jaw-droppingly gorgeous to look at, but it left me hopelessly unable to perform even the most basic function, because it's not built with that in mind. Another problem we have to consider is that cursed term, ludonarrative dissonance. The great divide between player autonomy and narrative cohesion. One where the choices are often either to make the avatar a sociopath, or have them feel really bad about the cycle of violence that they remain deeply invested in. When the avatar is musing on what it means to be noble, a guardian for the weak and a scourge of evil, but the player just wants to run everyone over. That's a concern. Both problems come round to the same issue. Games like these really struggle with accepting the identity of their medium. They don't want to be games. They want to be experiences. They want to emulate a filmic quality, be cinematic, most of the time giving little to no attention to the horny teenage sociopath holding the reins. What separates a game from other mediums, this interactive quality, pulls the audience much closer into the story they are a part of, makes them the hand guiding the plot forward, drawing them into this perfectly realised world. Paradoxically, this can have the opposite of the intended effect. Linearity being something of a bad word in game design is a stigma that is slowly waning, but there is a disparity between the artist's intended experience for the audience and the inability to reliably anticipate player action. This is where the animus comes in. By introducing a meta-narrative within the game where you are in the shoes of a person who is controlling another person, a barrier between the player and their actions is formed. This sounds like exactly the kind of thing you want to avoid, but it gives the player an intranarrative reason for a lot of the gamey aspects of the series, as well as creating a psychological loophole for any bad behaviour they might want to indulge in. Because with the animus in tow, Assassin's Creed becomes a game about playing a game, the sort of idea that one might make an Inception meme about five years ago. But actually, this ends up proving quite useful in eliminating some of the immersion-breaking hang-ups of the medium. Ubisoft invented a bridge between those two means of conveying information, a method that is both overt and abstract, which ends up placing something small and incongruous in the back of your mind that makes you think, yeah, this is okay. The best thing about this, as proven by the latter half of the series, is you don't even need much narrative justification for it. It can quietly sit in the background doing its thing. The world ending threat and first civilization nonsense can be happily packed away, leaving us with the simple tale of a megalomaniac corporate entity that uses game development as a means of controlling the populace. But enough about EA. These present day segments are certainly divisive, and I know many of you just want to immerse yourselves in these historical realms. That's the money shot of the franchise after all. So the animus might not be your cup of tea. On a critical level its execution leaves a hell of a lot to be desired, but it has its purpose, and it goes towards both giving the series a strong sense of immersion, and allowing the player to make peace with the medium. So ignore the animus if you must, but you'd miss it if it was gone. Bayek, come. Let me show you something inspiring. Huh? <laughs>